Alrighty, so we are conducting an oral history interview uh, for Mr. Uh, Don Lemley uh, and the Simla Historical Society. Um, will you tell me how old you are, please? 80. 80 years old, okay. Uh, when did your family come to Colorado, sir? Uh, my folks on my dad's side uh, come in 1909, uh, and my mother's... Uh, family come here in about 1900. 1900, okay. Uh, do you know why they moved to the area? Well, uh, I don't know about my mother's side. My dad's family come out here because my grandmother had asthma, and they come out here for her health. I see, I see. Um, let's see. Um, And uh, did you attend school in, in Simla here? Yes. Yeah? Oh, okay. From the 8th grade through high school. 8th grade through high school. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, and what year was that? Or what years were those? Or what year did you graduate? 1950. 1950. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so uh, what did you do for a living um, when, you, when you worked in Simla here? Well, actually, uh, I when I was in grade school, I was driving a tractor for different folks around the community, mm -hmm. and then uh, I never did get a job right in town. Mm -hmm. uh, so then, uh, after I got married, well, then we run a dairy out there for twenty years, and uh, then I had an opportunity to get an apprentice job working on airplanes. So then I did that for 24 years. Wow. Working on airplanes. Okay. And I wound up being service manager there for Beechcraft in the last oh, a little over a year. So. Okay. And, and that's the job you retired from? Yeah. Okay. Alright. Let me see. Um... So, um, you already told me you established a, a farmer ranch. Um, so, uh, what was the town like when you were younger? Oh, it was very active. I mean, there was uh, three grocery stores, uh -huh. and there was two cream stations, and... Uh, they was a, a Ford dealership and a Chevrolet dealership. And then uh, there was a tractor dealership also. Huh. Wow. What else was there? Oh, there was, I think there was three filling stations. I'm not sure. I can't remember now. And then I don't know. Yeah. There was several restaurants and stuff. Mm-hmm. But uh, and uh, where did most people work during those days from town here? Well, just in the grocery stores and uh, and uh, blacksmith shop, of course, and then uh, oh, there was the uh, garages where they worked on cars and stuff. They was I don't know a mm. couple or three of those in town, and then. Uh, of course, when Nichols Tilly's Tools got started, well, then they, they hired a lot of folks. Mm -hmm. But that was later years. Uh, I see. Nichols Tillage. Um, yeah. When did they get started? Oh. I suppose it was in the 50s. I'm not 50s. sure. Okay. And they were a steel manufacturing company They made or uh, chisel points for uh, chisel points. Uh, all this equipment, you know, farm equipment. They made those. Okay. Uh, and they're still going, but they're in, in uh, Sterling now. Sterling. Okay. They moved out because they, they, when the uh, railroad shut down, well, they moved. And and the railroad shut down what late late eighties early nineties or something uh, about in that time I think yeah okay 
Okay. So, um, how many uh, how many brothers and sisters did you have? Oh, uh, I had uh, two brothers. Two brothers. No, no sisters. Okay. Okay. Has your family mostly stayed in this area? Uh, no, my my. Uh, well, we had. Yeah, my two brothers did. They never did get married. They stayed out there at the ranch. And what are their names? Bernard and Ed. Ed died. Okay. And he was the youngest one of the bunch. Mm -hmm. He had uh, pancreatic cancer. And, it's tough. And then uh, uh, our kids uh, is still in the state. My daughter lives in Colorado Springs. and Well, my youngest son, he's back up here now. He's out at the ranch now. And then my other son is in the Weld County Sheriff's Department. Mm. And... Uh, my uh, daughter is an artist. She's well. They got a gallery over there in Colorado City. Hmm. And what are your sons and your daughter's names? Well, uh, um, Marty is my oldest son, and Barry is the youngest one, and then Donna is uh, the daughter. Ah, okay. So they've all stayed in Colorado. Yeah. Um, and your the ranch is still in the family yes. from what I'm hearing you yeah. say. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Where's that located? It's seven miles northwest of here. Seven miles northwest. On Road 117. Road 117. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, so, so you lived uh, you lived during the Depression, right? You were a kid then? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. What was that like? Well, <laughs> It was, uh, well, everybody was poor as hell, so it didn't make any, I mean, we thought that's just the way life was. Yeah. <laughs> and the only thing that I can remember is it was, we were a little different than the rest of them. Our car had uh, upholstering in it. Oh. But everybody else's, their upholstering was gone. Really? No <laughs> upholstery? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> and, you know, the headliner was gone and everything else, but... Our car had a posting in the top and a headliner and, and on the doors and stuff, and I don't know why it would survive. <laughs> did, they, did people use it for clothes or something like that? Or? No, no, they didn't do that. They just, uh, I don't know. They didn't uh, they, they used They used the, well, you know, you hauled cream cans and everything, and everything else, you used it like a pickup, really. Okay, yeah. Uh -huh. And, uh, uh, of course, Dad, Dad had set the cream cans, you know, in the, between the front seat and the back seat, yeah, and haul that stuff to town, and uh, anything else that you had to haul, you know, like a sack of something or something, all that. Of course, it didn't have a trunk or nothing, so you just threw that in the side. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> what kind of cars were they? Mostly it was Fords, and Dad had a Chevrolet, and then uh, uh, he finally traded it off, and and. Uh, Oh, uh, let's see what? Oh, we got a Buick. A Buick. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Uh, um, well, let's see. Um, were you ever in the service? No. No. I I got married too quick, and and then uh, when they called me, well, then. Uh, uh, we had a baby on the way, and and the the uh, they really raised hell with me because I didn't tell them, but I didn't even think about it, you know. Right. Yeah. Well, I they called me up for I had to go my physical and stuff, but uh, they give me a well, I think they call it four A or something like that. Oh, so so you so you were drafted, but they gave you. They they let you out of it because you had a family or yeah. something like that. Huh? Okay. And, and I thought about trying to maybe enlisting, but then I couldn't figure out how I was going to survive with that kind of money at that time. Right. Oh, it's tough. So I didn't do it. So. Sure. Um. So, uh, what's been the the greatest change or changes you've seen around town? Actually, the decline of the town. Yeah. That's that's been really the main thing. Yeah, can you describe the decline a little more? Well, just as the uh, 
agriculture got bigger and uh, of course at that time uh, they were trying to a lot of folks and trying to make it on 160 acres and uh, that just wasn't it did it worked for a little while when the when everything was oh the ground the ground was new and stuff you know and it it produced more of it like that and then uh, uh, they had seemed like they had more moisture then after the drought in the well I guess it was 30s it was 34 and 35 stuff mm -hmm. but then uh, it was of course then the war came along and and uh, they wanted everything farmed and stuff and everybody was farming everything and but the town was just booming at that time so you're saying the the soil wasn't as or was more fertile back oh, then? Oh yeah, and because see, as as it was farmed and the winds blew and everything else, and uh, we've got uh, well, you can see out there on our place where the there's oh at the at the north end of the place is the, there's piles that uh, probably six feet high that the wind swept the farmland up there and just dumped it on the fence line oh okay and uh, it just blew away the topsoil just blew away that's yeah. what happened I see I see and and people have gone to to mostly ranching around here I yeah well they should have been that way to start with yeah it never should have any of that shouldn't have been broke up especially north now in south uh, it's more flat you know but up there where we're at it's all hills and stuff uh -huh. and uh, it just wasn't it just wasn't meant to be farmed really yeah so so you suspect the 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 greatest change in other words has been the decline of the town and, and you it's tied in with with farming in yeah, the yeah. area yeah that's for sure and how that declined too okay um Let's see, Rama was the uh, when uh, my folks came out here. Of course, Simla wasn't even thought of then. Yeah. So they, they everybody landed in Rama because that was the big. Uh, well, they had all kinds of stuff there at that time, I guess. Mm -hmm. And uh, so my uh, my mother's folks, got, I guess, come out here in a covered wagon or in a wagon or something. But Dad's. Uh, family they uh, rented what they called a uh, uh, oh a, oh what do I want to say anyway it was a car special for uh, for uh, immigrant cars what they called it oh. and they loaded their horses and their belongings in that car and Came out, out to Rama. To Rama. And, and what time was it? what year was that again for me? Did you say uh, nineteen nine. Nineteen oh nine. Okay. Yeah. And then Rama's kind of a smaller, t well, it's even smaller than Simla now. Yeah. Seems, now. Yeah. 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 Of course, it wasn't really booming. Well, it, there was more going on in in Rama than there is now. But then, uh, Simla was ahead of Rama then later years. Uh -huh. Okay. And uh, of course, they were really similar. Was ahead of Matheson also. As far as, of course, like I say, there was a lot more going on in both of those towns than there is now. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, uh, do you have any any particular memories that stick out from when you were a kid? No, not. Uh, Uh, well, I I went to my first movie here in Simla. Yeah. When I was in the first grade, and it was the movie theater was in the uh, Baptist Church then. Oh yeah. And uh, I was going to Coons Crossing then because there wasn't enough kids for the school I was supposed to go to. So they the teacher was lived here in Simla, and she drove out that road, and then. I just walk over because we lived a half mile off the main road. Uh -huh. So I'd walk over there and she'd take me up to Coons Crossing to school. Well, then when they they had the Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs was, that was your down first. here, and 
she loaded all of us kids up and uh, brought us down to see that thing. And <laughs> wow. <laughs> of course, at that time, you know, there wasn't that many kids in school, but then yeah, <laughs> when you got up to, oh, I don't know, I think 12 was a whole bunch at that time. Yeah. And, of course, the, of course, those schools, you know, they had all the grades up to from the first to the eighth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, what was your wife's name? I'm sorry. Louise Wilsey. Oh, Louise Wilsey. Okay. Yeah. They uh, they were from Calhan. Their family was from Calhan, and Burl Wilsey was uh, the well. They lived here for years, and he was mayor for oh several years down here, and and then. Uh, they moved to Callahan and they bought the grocery store up there. They run the grocery store here. And then he moved up there. Well, he his wife died, and then they he had a ranch down south. And then, oh, he got married again, and then uh, uh, they moved to Callahan and he got a grocery store up there. And then, oh, that went from him his, to his son, and then his grandson run it for a while before they sold it to those other folks that's got it. Okay. Yeah. And you're married to Marilyn right now, right? Yeah. Okay. Marilyn. Um, what was her? Well, her name? It was Katz. Marilyn Katz. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's see. Um, and uh, do you remember uh, your first car? Yeah, it was a, uh, let's see, it was a 34 Chevrolet. I think it was 34. 34, huh? And, uh, I give $100 for it. $100, huh? Yeah. And it was a piece of junk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think most people's first cars are pieces of junk. Yeah. Well, at that time, you know, right after the war, because uh, they didn't, they didn't uh, bus the high school kids in. They had to stay in town and dorms and stuff at that time, and then uh, uh, when I was. In the eighth grade, of course, they were still, they weren't busing the kids in on the bus, the high school kids. So a lot of them was driving anything. A lot of them was uh, just a frame and a, and a seat. And, uh, that's <laughs> what they drove. <laughs> wow. <laughs> uh, but then uh, that, uh, well, I guess when I was in the eighth grade, they, the districts uh, got submerged with all these other districts around. And, Form District 100. Uh -huh. Well, then they, uh, we got to ride the bus for nothing. Yeah. So. So back then they got to school any way they could. Yeah. You said they had dorms, huh? Yeah. That's pretty interesting, huh? So, so kids who had farms in the outlying lands or ranch lands, they would, they would come in and stay at a dorm yeah. instead of going back and forth yeah. there, huh? Interesting stuff, and you said you drove a tractor when you were in elementary school, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you just till fields and stuff yeah. like that? Yeah. Okay. Huh. Yeah, I had. Uh, well, I look back on it now, and I was, yeah. you know, way out the hell and gone farming someplace, and I'm thinking, what if something had happened? You know, I'm out there all by myself, right? And uh, every once in a while, I'd get stuck and have to unhook the one way and. I always carried a chain so that I could drag it out of a bog. And, uh, of course, see, I I knew better than to ask the folks for money because they didn't have any. And, they, well, I was, you know, if you wanted money, you just walked, went out and worked and got it. Yeah. And we, all of us guys was that way at that time because a lot of the kids my age worked in the grocery stores here in town. And... Uh, that give them jobs, and they had other, oh, everything they could do, think of, you know, the yard work or anything else to make a few dollars. Yeah. So uh, we all worked. I mean, we didn't. 
depend on our folks to give us money. That wasn't that didn't happen. Sure. Huh. And um, you live in town here right now, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, how long have you been in town? Oh, it's been four years. Four years. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So you lived out on the ranch before that? Yeah. Or? Okay. And um, let's see. Uh, so, um, are there any, or were there any, uh, like community traditions or celebrations <coughs> um, that the town did on a regular basis? Uh, Labor Day was one of them. Uh -huh. They always had a. Ever since I can remember, they had a celebration on Labor Day, mm -hmm. and then they had these. Uh, oh, like the John Deere would have called what they call John Deere days, mm -hmm. and they'd come here and and show movies and advertise their tractors and stuff. And uh, uh, oh, there was there was quite a lot doing them days. But that one thing that was always was Labor Day. They they always had something going on in Labor Day. Hmm. And uh, let's see. Um, any anything special you remember from the Labor Day celebration that they they either did in the past or that they still do? No, it was well. They had uh, oh different outfits to come here and sing and and then they had uh, magicians that put on a show and uh, oh they'd have different uh, well like they had uh, contests for people that drew the had the highest corn stalk and and uh, the heaviest wheat and beans and all kinds of stuff like that Ah, uh, okay. Um, I'm gonna grab a, uh, I'm gonna grab a map real quick and and just see if there's anything that. Uh, let's So, um, we're looking at a map from, um, I think, 1939, 1949, so right around the time when you were... Um, well, of course, there's our schoolhouse. Yeah. And then... Uh, and that's... My uncle Bert's house was over here, I think. It's right on the cat corner from the school. And then he built most of these homes down this street here. What what street is that? Is that Pueblo? Uh, Pueblo, yeah. Okay. And then. Uh, and your uncle's full name was again. Bert Hofer. Bert Hofer. Okay. Yeah. And then this was the. Uh, well, let's see. It had to be the hotel. It was this one here? I think. Okay. So that's. And then the. The grocery store and was up in right in this there was one grocery store in this street and one here on the corner and, that's and then the there was a grocery store uh there was three grocery stores on this street here so that's sioux street right there yeah. there were three grocery stores on sioux street yeah okay and uh i don't know is this highway 24 here that is yeah highway okay. 24 going through the center of town yeah. Okay, well then the, the, all the grocery stores be on this side. Okay. And so then, right where like uh, the Sioux Street Apartments and the and the uh, liquor store and the Ranch Land News are at now, they were kind of along that street yeah, there. Yeah. They uh, and then the well the the one grocery store was just north of the where the uh, uh, paper office is. Uh, it was in that where that trailer house is now. Oh, okay. And they had what they called a big four hall. Uh, Big Four Hall. Yeah. Well, this must be the. Uh, that's the apartment. That's I apartment house. Yeah, this would be the Big Four here. What was that? Oh, they had uh, different things in there. They. Uh, 
they had a dealership in there. Well, that's of course that that building's still there where the dealership was. Uh-huh. Uh, this big four was just south of that. Let's see, it'd be south. Yeah, it'd be south. And they tore it down. Okay. But uh, oh, at one time they had a mortuary in there, and and I don't know what all. And then uh, uh, oh, Moore's had a uh, international dealership in there, and of course it was a dealer before that also. I see. And then on the other side of the street was where the where the Ford dealership was. Uh, well, it's where that. Uh, arched trust building is on the, on the east side of the street. It's still there. It's uh, oh, it's for sale now, I guess. On yeah. Sioux Street, there. Yeah. Okay, so that. Uncle got, Bert built that. Uh, it was the first arch trust building in the country. Huh. And I don't. It doesn't show it up there very good for some reason. Yeah, I think that may be it. But, yeah. yeah. Huh. Well, uh, let's see. Do you have anything else? Any other memories or anything like that you want to share, or any messages to future folks who might listen to this? Just a good place to live. Yeah, Simla is <laughs> a good place to live. Okay, good deal. Of course, right. I've never lived anywhere else. But <laughs> well, the first two years after I got married, we we lived in Denver, and I worked for Rainbow Bread. Mm -hmm. But uh, then I got a chance to come back and get into the dairy business. And, uh, so you enjoy was, the country life better than the city life. Yeah. Yeah. But. Uh, of course, after I look back on it, I wished I hadn't got into the dairy business, but then. Yeah. The way things worked out, uh, of course, I was always interested in airplanes. I mean, you know, from the get-go. I mean, that was, so, and I never had the, I never did even think that I'd ever get where I was with aviation. But, uh. Like I say, I was I sold the cows and I was on my way to Colorado Springs to look for a job. Well, I was thought maybe I'd get a job working for a cement outfit on the other side of the highway up there. Well, I got later in the afternoon and they were close, so I the Metal Lake Airport was just across the road there. So I went in there and asked this old boy if I could get a job, and and he was kind of an ornery son of a gun, <laughs> and. Uh, so he was hard up for help, so he hired me. And I stuck it out there for three years. And because uh, he had to work as an apprentice for three years before you were eligible for a license. So I logged all what I was doing and all that stuff. And then uh, went to Oklahoma City and, and they took my test and stuff down there. and got my license. Well, then as soon as I got my license, well, I quit him. <laughs> well, then I worked for another guy there for a while, and then I got a chance to uh, work, get a job over at Beechcraft, so I went over there, and I worked there for 10 years, and they sold out to Raytheon. Of course, Raytheon sold, or got rid of all their smaller outfits, because they weren't interested in small airplanes. They was after that missile that uh, that government contract at Beach had that missile. Mm -hmm. So uh, that ended that. Well, then I worked for a guy that had a flight school, and uh, I went back out to Metal Lake and worked out there till uh, I finally decided to quit. But it was it was I enjoyed it. I mean, it was oh, I just. I just had the capability, I guess, to, I, it never, uh, it wasn't hard for me, I just, 
kind of come at natural, I guess. Natural mechanic, huh? Yeah. Doesn't come to everybody. <laughs> and uh, it, uh, well, I, I overhauled lots of engines and never had a problem with any one of them. And uh, so I turned the service manager down twice there at Beach because I really didn't, I wasn't really interested in, in the job, but it kind of come down to, well, they didn't have anybody to pick but me. <laughs> so, okay, I'll take it. Yeah. But I guess I made them happy because they never, they were, uh, Beach was very uh, stern on customer service. Mm -hmm. And uh, every once in a while they'd call me up and say, well, how's things going? I said, well, okay, I guess. Well, good. And that was the end of it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that works. Yeah. <laughs> Great. So. Yeah. So most of your life as an aircraft mechanic, uh, um, let's see. Uh, we done uh, emergency work for the airlines. Oh. Uh -huh. And uh, one of my hardest decisions I ever made, I think, was... Uh, see, the the rule was when when they called a mechanic, the airlines called it. It was your airplane until you said it could go. Uh huh. I mean, it was it was your decision. So they called me down there, and the and the crew thought they smelled smoke in the cabin. So I goes down there, and we taxis out on the runway and run the airplane up and everything else. Well, I couldn't smell smoke. So what am I going to do? You know, I I couldn't really say, well, we got to ground this thing because because I couldn't smell smoke. So uh -huh. I said, well, it's okay. Signed her off, and it was okay. It was okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm thinking, if that thing blows up in the air, I'll never get over this. Yeah, yeah. But uh, it was fine. I mean. But until you, uh, you know, and they and they used to school us on how to fill out the logbooks because you didn't say you uh, removed this part because it failed. Because if it got into a lawsuit, then you had to, you know, the part failed. Well, that was good for lawyers. So you had to write in there, it didn't function as it was designed to do or something. <laughs> it didn't fail. It just didn't work right. <laughs> I see. <laughs> so that was a big deal. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and they, there at Beach, they even, they talk, you know, they said, well, when you got customers in there, you don't bad mouth anything. You know, when you're talking about among yourselves, mm -hmm. just keep your mouth shut. And because uh, there was always this, uh, well, Beach had us secured for a hundred million dollars each mm. for things like that. Oh, liability and yeah. such. Okay, so like insurance or something. Yeah, like there was there was the, uh, and uh, we'd get. Well, we had an airplane that I we worked on and I worked on, and it was a retractable gear airplane. Well, the guy took off and went to uh, Las Vegas or to uh, Salt Lake City, and uh, he claimed the gear wouldn't come down. Mm -hmm. So uh, supposedly he had uh, witnesses from the tower that he was landing with the nose gear up. So uh, they uh, he run, he filed a lawsuit, and it went from. Oh, I think they started out in uh, Utah. Anyway, it went from Utah to to Kansas, and then it wound up here in Colorado. But each time that it'd go from one state to the other, they'd bring these pictures in. And I looked at these pictures, and I knew there was something wrong with the way the airplane looked from the pictures, that it wasn't right. And the last time they showed me those pictures, well, he, this guy took pictures of the landing gear and stuff. Well, they had a hydraulic cylinder that run the gear down, the nose gear. Well, they all run on a hydraulic cylinder. Yeah. 
anyway, uh, there that that the part that that pushed it down, you know, it was clear out. Uh -huh. So that cylinder was fully extended. Uh -huh. Well, it was bent like this, you know, it was like that. Uh -oh. Well, see what he done. He he landed hard on the nose and buckled that shaft. And that, uh, so I, uh, the guys that had the picture, well, I said, we got an airplane like that sitting out on the ran on the line. Uh -huh. So we went out there and measured that and then uh, figured out a scale, how long the picture was, and that proved that that cylinder was completely out. Uh -huh. That was the end of the lawsuit. Wow. Cool. I mean, all the all his people that he had to see that the, the wheel was still up, they all disappeared. <laughs> that ended the lawsuit right then. <laughs> good. <laughs> but he good. cut his own throat by taking all those pictures. Right, right. Yeah, that's good. Wow. But, uh, <laughs> so, averted that disaster. Yeah. You don't think about that a lot, though. Um, you know, how much someone has to basically put their neck on the line when they're signing off on an airplane, especially yeah. one with a lot of passengers on it. Yeah. Well, even the small ones, you know, they'd, uh, uh, they, these lawyers get a hold of these things and they'd sue the company, the people that made the part, if it was, you know, made by somebody else, like the alternators and the starters and stuff. Carburetors was made by other than the manufacturer of the airplane. They, well, and then the engines was either Lycoming or Continental. And uh, they'd go after everybody in the mechanics. And of course, whenever you signed those logbooks, you listed all you'd done and say this, this aircraft is airworthy and sign your name with your number. Mm -hmm. Hmm. And... Uh, that's the moment right there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I had a doctor one time that, well, I'd measured the engine and uh, uh, we, over, uh, well, we didn't overhaul the propeller, but we sent it out and everything. And I, uh, I tried to get him to come out and fly the thing around the pattern and let me check it out. Well, he come out there about dark one night, headed for Las Vegas. Well, he jumped in the airplane the way he went. Yeah. Well, he didn't have any trouble, but it kind of made me a little bit nervous because I'd run it on the ground and stuff, but then the flying it is a little different. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But that's the way it was. Yeah. Well, good stuff. Well, yeah, I don't, I don't really have any more questions unless you have something else you can recall that you like to tell about or anything else no it was yeah I think uh, I think uh, we learned more in school at that time than we do now they yeah. do now because by the time I got out of the second grade I could read and write and do math a little bit you know yeah uh -huh. yeah and uh, we had this uh, <laughs> math book they had the th three monkeys uh -huh. Jocko Jerry and Jojo <laughs> Well, Jojo was the iron man. Yeah. So he'd climb up a tree and throw co coconuts on his Jocko and Jerry's head. <laughs> well, then, how many coconuts did Jojo throw on their heads? <laughs> and they'd be in a pile, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so you'd count the coconuts. <laughs> that was the, the math lesson. <laughs> yeah. Wow. That was the first and second grade math book. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, it was... It worked. Yeah, yeah. That's interesting stuff. Good deal. Yeah. Of course, we all walked to school because they had those schools close enough that you could either ride, walk or ride a horse or something. Yeah. And uh, I mean, it was just something we'd done. We didn't, because I walked two miles. And uh, two miles, huh? Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so long. Do you have any grandkids? Yeah. 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 Yeah, I got uh, three. Three? Yeah. Any great grandkids? Yeah, I got four of those. Four of those? Huh? Wow, that's a lot yeah, of my, uh, my grandson, he's uh, uh, 
he's flying, uh, he's in the, uh, well, he started out with the Colorado Air Guard, and he was a crew chief on the F-16s. And then uh, he's got airplanes in his blood, mm-hmm. so uh, he'd learned how to fly a private, he had his private license anyway. He got a chance to, uh, they were kind of looking at him up there at uh, Cheyenne for the 130s, mm-hmm. C-130s. So he went up there and then they sent him to, uh, well, he took some training, they sent him to officer's training first because he had to be an officer to, to fly an airplane. Mm-hmm. Well, then he uh, flew down to Pueblo for a little while and then they sent him to Corpus Christi, Texas. Mm-hmm. And then they flew the bigger ones down there, uh, the King Airs down there, and then uh, then he's in Arkansas now, and and he's uh, uh, flying simulator down there. But then he's going to go back to pretty quick this month, I think, back to Cheyenne, and then he'll be flying the one thirties there. Mm-hmm. But. Uh, I was really amazed that when he, his graduation down there, when he got his wings in Corpus Christi, well, the general from uh, Buckley came down and he was, because Jonathan was the only one that was graduating from the, from Buckley. Mm. And the general from the Buckley come down and give my grandson his first wings that he got when he got his wings. <laughs> and he said, I didn't have any sons, and he said, I wanted you to have these wings because you're one of the best young men I've ever had under my command. Hmm. Wow. That's special. Yeah. General. Wow. Hmm. Great. Yeah, so maybe he got the, his love for airplanes <laughs> from you, huh? Yeah. Well, my son uh, on the Sheriff's Department there in Weld County, he got his... He flew too because they were hauling prisoners around over the whole, even the U.S. So the uh, sheriff department had to, they leased this airplane. Hmm. So Monty got his license and he was flying it. And uh, then uh, the uh, folks up there they got wind that, that the sheriff department had an airplane. Well. Well, this was all a waste of money. Uh-huh. Well, it turned out it wasn't, but anyway, because, you know, you fly prisoners on an airplane, uh-huh. on an airliner. Well, different airlines have different rules, and then a lot of the airliners make to buy a whole bunch of seats around them. And of course, they're carrying their weapons and stuff. Uh-huh. And that cost a lot of money. And it was actually a lot cheaper to have that old, their own airplane, and they didn't right. have to go through all that stuff. Right. Yeah. And then he had... He got, um, my son got this program going with all the other agencies all over the state, so they'd uh, coordinate their, if somebody had to go someplace to get a prisoner, or they had somebody that could, they were going to send down there, or where the hell that was at, they could work together and, and uh, transport all this, these guys, you know, all over the country without sure. mm-hmm. every agency going the same place after different folks. And, Sure. And uh, wow. Um, let's see. Uh, any any messages to uh, your grandkids or great grandkids at all? No. No. Okay. All right. Well, we'll go ahead and and wrap it up then. Um, hard to believe it's been forty five minutes, but. Uh, <laughs> All right.